Now, uh, again, welcome to our workshop. I'm Marcus Schmidt. I have the honor to moderate this workshop. And uh, the experts that are in the studio are Jennifer Robinson, Peter Knopp, and online with us is Johanna Boyer, uh, actually joining us from the US. So we are talking about experts. Uh, Jen, what are you an expert in? <laughs> um, I'm an audiologist. Um, and here at Medell, I'm a senior product manager. And so um, I guess uh, this, the aspect of fitting cochlear implants and how they work, so to yes. speak. And all the applications. So, and so, all the applications. So, so, so rather rather right. <laughs> user-based. Uh, yep. OK, Peter, what is your expertise? Uh, I'm an electrical engineer by education. I'm one of the directors in R&D. And my responsibilities include the audio signal processing in the Medell CI system. So this is the front-end audio signal processing and coding strategies and the entire fitting system. OK, so you are basically responsible for what the, the cochlear implant is actually stimulating. Right, I'm basically responsible for what the cochlear implant makes out of the sound okay. that's picked up by the microphone. Okay. Okay. And how these things are then delivered to the auditory system. Okay, good, thank you. Johanna, uh, you are a musicologist. Uh, what does a musicologist do? Oh, I got this question many times when I was studying. Um, so musicology is the study of music the scholarly analysis and research-based research study of music. And although I focused on historical musicology during my studies, I have now focused much more on systematic um, musicology in my job. So that includes music theory, um, music pedagogy, music or related to physiology and psychology. So what do I do at Medell? I focus on music and cochlear implants as it relates to research, rehabilitation, education, and awareness. So I um, support studies. I also conduct studies. I um, create or try to find new uh, resources to uh, practice music, to train music. And sometimes I get the chance to do um, music workshops. Like for example, I conducted a choir workshop uh, last June in Austria, which was a really fun experience. Okay, thank you. Uh, and now, dear participants in this meeting, we also would like you to introduce yourself. We have a little poll for this, and uh, maybe we can uh, start this, and you can tell us uh, who you are, and the poll that should, uh, that should come up. is asking, you know, what's your background? Are you a hearing implant user? Are you a parent or a caretaker of a, uh, a, an implanted child? Are you a hearing implant uh, candidate? Are you a professional working in the hearing implant field? Or are you just nothing of the above and you're just interested in, uh, in this topic? Okay, so we see that uh, it's interesting. the majority is hearing implant users and, and parents. Mm -hmm. Okay, we do have some professionals. Okay, so we have a good mix actually of, mm -hmm. uh, of people here. Thank you, thank you. So uh, what we will do in this workshop actually is not just, uh, you know, randomly, uh, you know, answer questions, we want to do a little intro actually. Uh, this workshop is part of Sound Sensation, the Metal Music Festival. So it's about music and hearing implants. And so this is what we want to also do in our introduction. We want to talk about technology, specifically actually uh, specs, uh, technology of cochlear implants. There are other hearing implants. Um, and then we want to see how that relates to, uh, to music. So, Jen, can you give us a little introduction into, you know, how hearing works, how a cochlear implant works? Yeah, absolutely. And to do this, I, I have some videos that I'm going to share just to help 
bring the point across. So let's start with um, how to how how hearing in general works. Hearing is is I, I'm sorry. Sound is made up of vibrations, and so speech, music, it's all sound vibrations. And what happens for the outer ear, the outer ear is like the gatherer, so to speak. And it funnels or directs these sound vibrations down the ear canal. As the ear canal um, directs the sound and that goes straight to the eardrum. The eardrum then starts to vibrate and that in turn will make the three bones in the middle ear vibrate. That then transfers the sound to the cochlea. The cochlea we'll, we'll spend some time talking about today. The cochlea is the main hearing organ within the ear. Now the cochlea is designed in a, in a unique way in that the sound perception or the pitch is organized and we call this tonotopic pitch, tonotopic placement or place pitch. So at the base of the cochlea is high pitches. And as you go up the cochlea, you get to the low pitches. Now throughout the cochlea, there are hair cells. And these hair cells will move with the movement of the fluid that's in there. And this movement of the fluid makes, the, as I said, the hair cells move. When the hair cell moves, it sends a signal to the brain. And these hair cells are all the way up the cochlea. So if it is in the base region where the high frequencies are, the hair cell will move and it'll signal to the brain, hey, I'm in the high pitch region. And if the, set, if the hair cell is in the low pitch region, then the same thing. When it signals to the brain, it says, hey, I'm in the low pitch region. So our ears are set up, our cochlea is set up. So there is a natural place to pitch. Wherever the place in the cochlea is that's being stimulated, that's how the pitch is known. With, with cochlear implants, an electrode is put into the cochlea. And what happens is the audio processor processes sound and that then is delivered through impulses into the cochlea. Now we believe with Medell having a long electrode that stimulates the whole cochlea is important because of this aspect of place and pitch. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, Peter, we, we said that you are the experts in uh, you know, basically designing what the, what the uh, implant stimulates. What is important to know about the stimulation of a cochlear implant? Right. Um, okay. So as Jane said, a, a cochlear implant really tries to exploit the uh, tonotopical principle of the cochlea. Uh, what's producing neural activity uh, from the base of the cochlea, the brain turns into something that sounds high pitched to you, a high pitched tone and uh, neural activity that uh, originates from the apical region of the cochlea, the brain translates into a low pitch tone. And this is exactly what we at Medell really use uh, extensively and very close to how nature does it in our system. One of the core parts of our system, one of the core philosophies of our system really is to really use the entire cochlea for electrical stimulation, as you can see on the left side here. Here you have a Medell electrode inserted all the way up into the low frequency region of the cochlea, that's where the, green, the, where the red color is, and then covering all the frequencies from the low frequencies, if you follow my mouse, uh, to the mid frequencies, to the high frequencies in the, in, the, in, the, in the blue region, so that low frequency tones that are 
then used to stimulate the most apical electrode really sound low and high frequency tones that are used to stimulate the most basal electrode or one of the basal electrodes really sound high. This is in contrast to how other systems work, like the system shown on the right, where the electrode only covers what we call here, the first turn of the cochlea. Here on the left, the electrode covers more than one turn, almost two turns of the cochlea. So here, the electrode stops in the middle, uh, mid-frequency region of the cochlea. So that low frequency tones that are stimulated, that are used to stimulate the most apical electrode on the array only sound mid-pitched, but not really low-pitched. Whereas high frequency tones then really again sound high pitch because the uh, location of the most basal electrode here is more or less the same as here. So while this really translates the, uh, the baseline of a piece of music into really something like, that sounds like bass, boom, 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 this turns the baseline of a piece of music that sounds like mid-pitched, mid, um, mid like boom, 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 right? So if you want to hear the bass, like the bass sounds to a normal hearing person, then please um, uh, use, a, use a system that provides long electrodes and really covers the entire electrode. But Peter, Peter, there, there are some people that say there is a hearing zone within the cochlea right. that, that only part right. of the cochlea can reasonably be stimulated and other parts cannot reasonably be stimulated. What do you right. say about that? Right. Now, that is a... Uh, that is a um, a, uh, a discussion that was going on for many, many years. Is there something in the, um, in the apical region of the cochlea to stimulate? And there is fascinating new images from the cochlea, from research that's uh, done collaboratively between Canada and Sweden that really show that yes, the entire cochlea is a hearing zone. The term hearing zone is not <clears throat> wrong. It's just wrong to apply that term only to a part of the cochlea. And this is what, you, what we call the hearing zone. Well, this is, shows the cochlea. The thing in green is the basal membrane. You can see that on here on the next slide better. The thing in green is the basal membrane. That's the thing that turns a, a frequency of sound into something that is place specific in the cochlea. So the basal membrane for a certain frequency peaks or most heavily rings, so to speak, so vibrates at a certain point along the cochlea. And that's what Jane called the tonotopicity of the cochlea. And those vibrations of the basal membrane are then turned into information to the brain by the yellow structure here, which is called the spiral <coughs> ganglion. And for a long time, it was really debated whether there is neural structures beyond the first turn of the cochlea. Now, these new images really show that the answer to this question is yes. The spiral ganglion, again, which is in yellow here, f to, uh, uh, extends far beyond the first turn. The first turn ends about here, yeah? And as you can see, there is yellow structures far into the second turn of the cochlea. So that really, again, confirms that it really makes sense to get an electrode, not only into the first turn of the, the cochlea, but into the first and second turn of the cochlea and really use the uh, full potential of the cochlea for turning electrical stimulation into sound sensations. Okay, thank you. So, so the entire cochlea can be stimulated. And, and to the audience, why you know people are so excited about this image is you have to imagine uh, that uh, this entire structure that you see here uh, on the screen is only a few millimeters mm -hmm. uh, in size. And uh, so this is really uh, imaging technology uh, very, very sophisticated. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so Peter, uh, in, in natural hearing, uh, this this apical turns, uh, so the, the, the low frequencies uh, is handled differently in normal hearing uh, than the rest of the cochlea. Right. It's uh, face locking, that's the, the term. Uh, does that play a role in cochlear implants? Uh, it does, very much so. Where's my mouse? I can't see my mouse. There you go. Okay, uh, yes. 
Okay, so I said the uh, it's important to have an electrode or to have electrode contacts, not only in the low to mid frequency region, so in the first turn, but also have electrode contacts in the second turn, uh, um, uh, like here in the green, in the red and, and orange area. Now here, the cochlea works um, somewhat different to, where, to how the cochlea works for the rest for the mid to high frequencies or the rest of the cochlea. In this area, there is another what we call code or another piece of information that signals to the brain uh, information about sound frequency. Uh, remember the first bit of information is tonotopicity. Where is the cochlea stimulated? Also in acoustic hearing, where does the basal membrane stimulate the cochlea in response to a certain frequency? In the low frequency region, there is a second element of information, and that's timing information. In the low frequency region, um, in the low frequency region, yes, in the low frequency region here, um, the uh, the uh, the neural structures or the cochlea sends information to the brain in synchrony with the sound signal that is with the same frequency as the sound signal that comes in. So not only by identifying where neurons, uh, where the information originates from in the cochlea for a low frequency, can the, work, can the brain work out frequency and translate that into pitch, but also at what rate, how many, at how many points in time does information arrive at the brain? Uh, from that location in the low frequencies. That's another source of information for the brain to work out frequency. And that's exactly what we do in Medell to really drive those apical electrodes as close as possible to how the, this region of the cochlea is stimulated or driven in, uh, in normal hearing. We don't stimulate these uh, electrode contacts at some artificial high stimulation rate like we do in the mid and high frequency region and like it is done in other systems across the entire array. No, we at Medell in the low frequency region in the second turn of the cochlea that is so particular and so important for low, for low pitch sound sensation, we drive those electrodes uh, in synchrony again with the sound signal. So that the same mechanism that is taking place here in normal hearing is, uh, is modeled in our system to drive the low frequency region and thereby substitute the low frequency hearing with our cochlear implants uh, as closely as possible as it's done in natural hearing. Okay, so, so we uh, at Medell uh, is mimicking natural behavior basically. Across so, the entire cochlea really. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a question, uh, you often hear that all cochlear implant systems are basically the same. H how would you respond uh, to, to, to such a comment? You want to say something? I, I, I think that um, one of those things it comes from our, our users out there in terms of the feedback that they give. Mm -hmm. um, and um, anything to add to that, Peter? I mean, well, I just want to mention two two aspects that I just mentioned before. Um, let me just scroll up and then back, scroll back down. Um, this is Medell on the left side here. Yeah. This is other cochlear implant systems on the right yeah. side here. So no, they are not all the same. Medell is the only company that really uses, that really stimulates the entire cochlea and not, does not leave out the low frequency region that as you will hear from Johanna later is really important to, to, to appreciate or fully appreciate a piece of music. Yep. Uh, and that is the, so to speak, double play, you know, between yep. the bass line and the music line and the higher pitches and the piece of music. And the same down here. 
since Medell is the only company that's got uh, electrode contacts in the apical region that are driven or stimulated, right? Uh, at, uh, at, at sound following frequency. Again, not all cochlear implant systems are the same. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we've learned uh, med LCIs stimulate the entire cochlea. They stimulate the, the, the low pitch region like nature does. Uh, and, and we've seen colorful pictures. Uh, does that make a difference though in, in, in real life? It does, just as I said a second ago, uh, feedback from our users. Um, and comments that that we hear, and I and I've uh, prepared just a few slides uh, to show um, everyone what our uh, what Medell users are saying. Um, for example, uh, one user from Australia has said, from changing from a competitor's device. Having the Medell implant is the best thing I ever did because it sounds so much better. I recently had my left ear re-implanted with Medell and it's been a very big change. The first thing I noticed was that I can actually hear speech in my left ear. At activation, I was so excited to be able to hear the actual words that were being said. And on the train journey home, I cried in tears of joy and thankfulness for being able to hear speech in that ear for the first time in 60 years. I'm now even able to appreciate music, which is truly beautiful and out of this world. For me, getting a Medell cochlear implant was a real miracle. So as I said earlier, when you ask, you know, are um, all devices the same? We hear from our users, no, that's not the case. Here's a, another quote from a user. With the old CI, however much the complexity of the music was lost and music sounded blurry and mushy. I became frustrated with the old CI and gave up listening to music entirely. As soon as I started to listen to music with the Medell CI, however, I was carried away with emotion and cried because it was the first time and several years that I could enjoy music to the same degree as before I went deaf in one ear. It was so beautiful. I could now hear specific instruments and notes. And over time, I could again appreciate the complexity and color of music. Uh, another one, um, they had another device on one side and that other device they said that it was more robotic, tinny, echoey. They couldn't distinguish between different voices. It sounded metallic. But with the Medell side, it sounded um, more clear and pleasant and less fatigue. And we also ask um, our recipients. We, we surveyed over 100. And what we see, again, in the survey, Music sounds natural to me, and I enjoy listening to music with my cochlear implant system. Okay. So it does make a difference. Okay. Well, thank you. That's very impressive. Uh, now uh, we, we hear about uh, you know listening to uh, to speech, listening to music. Johanna, uh, how is music different from from speech? Uh, you know, is is that basically the same, or does it make a difference? Okay, so how is music different, especially compared to speech? And I want us to step back for a moment um, and think about that there is an important aspect that makes music so interesting and emotional to us. Um, and this is how tension uh, and release built throughout a musical piece. So, Yes, ten, uh, tension release is built in music and this is what makes us connect emotionally. So now when we compare um, music and speech, then uh, we know that music has a much wider range of frequencies uh, as well as a wider range of dy uh, a wider dynamic range. So let me give an example. Originally, um, when cochlear implants were developed, and focused entirely on speech, the frequency range started at 250 hertz. 
And um, when you think about a piano, an 88 key piano, then that frequency range starts actually at 27 hertz. So, you know, there is um, a very wide range that was missed at that point. And um, as I said before, also a more a larger dynamic range is used in music. Like think about film music or orchestral music, opera, um, where we have so many participants that play music or we have much bigger uh, changes in loudness, but also subtleties really matter. And um, so this, these are basically um, the wider range of frequencies and the wider range of dynamics. We want to use that in order, these are basically the requirements to build more of tension and release in music. And um, we've heard a lot from Jen and Peter about the, the second turn, the, the right place pitch. And again, for music, low frequencies are so important and where and how we present them through a cochlear implant matters. So I want to share a short music sample and Jen, I hope you help me out here. Absolutely. Um, thank you. And so basically what I wanna show you is two different music samples comparing two situations. How does it sound when we reach uh, the apex and how does it sound when we don't? So let's start uh, when you're ready. Um, how does it sound when we don't reach the apex? Okay, thanks. And let's now at the low frequencies, please. Thank you, Jen. So really the point that I want to make here is what happens when all this low frequency is missing. Um, basically you're missing out half of the piano that was shown below. And um, I think you get an impression what you're emotionally missing, what the music is mi missing in terms of the potential to create tension and release. Uh, I think that becomes really clear. And um, one more thing that I'd like to add here, how is music different? Um, music is, much more complex than speech. And I think there are multiple layers. And I want to bring up one example for you to think about, which is think about a speech-related complex situation. So speech and noise. Um, when we are at a very noisy restaurant, let's say, typically we still try to focus on one speaker and we try to ignore the background noise. But when we listen to, let's say, a very complex music situation, maybe a symphony, then we have 50 instruments playing um, at different frequency ranges, different pitches, um, different timbres. They are not always playing the same melody, right? And um, it's not that we just want to focus on one instrument and ignore the rest. We want that everything comes together and we want to enjoy how this get integrates with each other. And so if speech is, um, let's say, what's the word? It's um, degraded. If speech is degraded, we, we might still uh, hear the content, the words, but um, that's not enough when it comes to music. We, we want really the full range. Okay, thank you, Johanna. So, so we, we learned that music is much more complex, a much more complex sound than speech. And I think this is also important that, you know, you, you, speech is to be understood, but music is not only to be understood, but it's to be enjoyed. So, so there's yes. an enjoyment part to it. Uh, by the way, uh, all these uh, graphics that you have seen are on the medel.com uh, website on a page that's called, uh, what does a CI sound like? And uh, so, however, you, you know, stories are different. You know, some of our, our especially cochlear implant users uh, are, are, you know, we have born deaf uh, children. We have adults that, uh, you know, turn deaf. 
uh, we have uh, you know other hearing impairments for for many reasons different uh, durations of deafness so so, so there's a lot of different uh, people out there with different experiences and and we get and we got this uh, question actually uh, through social media uh, where it says well uh, you know I still don't uh, you know music doesn't sound so good to me you know despite maybe a, you know a, a long electrode and and all these things uh, now my my question uh, can music be trained yes it can um, and I think you know cochlear implant users um, when they are talking with their audiologists, um, they hear probably a lot that they need to practice when it comes to speech. And the same is true for music. To get the best benefit out of your cochlear implant for, for speech, for music, you have to practice. So, 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 so what, is, what, is, uh, what is a good way to, to train music? Uh, are there, you know, can, can you give, uh, you know, Sure. Uh, so some some hints on, on, on what to do. Yeah, and that's what I'm here for. So typically when I talk with um, our cochlear implant users about how to practice music, I talk about three different forms of training, which is active music listening, ear training, and ideally some active form of music engagement, either if they're played an instrument before or some other music therapy participation. Um, and, um, you know, when it comes to ear training, I think a lot of people are lost um, if they don't have a music background. Like many uh, Google implant users report that they don't know resources or they don't, they don't know how to practice and they get stuck. And that's why I'm really, really excited to share uh, that um, Medel has been collaborating with Meludia, um, which is an online music training program that will help you with music ear training. And uh, as part of the Medel Music Festival Sound Sensation, we've started a promotion on Thursday uh, and globally launched this collaboration. And I think my colleague will um, share some links with you because everyone that can access my Medel um, has access to Meludia and Medel will offer free unlimited 12 months licenses for you. So you can start your music training today. And I'm really excited because it allows you to practice independently at home whenever you have time. It's a very, oh, by the way, I think we have a slide for this. Um, <laughs> which I forgot about. Jen, would you mind uh, pulling it up for me? Um, again, this is can be used by all our MyModel um, account users, no matter if you're a hearing implant user, no matter if you're professional or a parent. Meludia um, is really a comprehensive tool uh, that you can use independently for long-term music training. There are over 600 exercises with over 1 million sound sequences. So you could be busy for the next three to five years with this. And um, it's accessible to all our hearing implant users. And we've tested the suitability. And I, I believe it's possible to use this independent of your age uh, indication, how long you've been using your cochlear implant and independent of your musical background. Uh, this is for adults as well as for children. So it's a one tool for everyone. And um, our goal with this is to help you further improve your music perception and most of all your enjoyment. That's great. Uh, and uh, Melodia is not only for, for, for hearing implant users, uh, but you know, I've tried it uh, myself, and uh, I have to say there's some some of the tasks are, are uh, tough. I mean, uh, so so actually, yeah, I, will, depending... I, I will look further into into Melodia <laughs> for my own musical training. Sure, yeah, uh, actually, you know, any Medel internal can also start practicing music um, if you're interested. And um, so I recently got the question: Is music training for everyone? Obviously, um, 
you know, music is not a priority for everyone. So I think it's more likely that people that are, have a high interest in music will immediately start practicing with Melodia. But uh, music training has a lot of other benefits. Research has shown that musicians uh, are very sensitive listeners and have certain advantages like understanding speech and noisy backgrounds. So I think Melodia uh, and, and this ear training can also benefit for, for speech improvements and speech understanding and noise. So it's not just good for music, although this is our focus and priority. Okay, that's great. Uh, so uh, thank you for, for your, your presentations. And uh, now we come to, a, uh, to, the, to the question part. Uh, please uh, put your questions uh, into the chat. And uh, while you're doing this, we have a little poll for you again. And we have prepared actually eight questions uh, that we thought may be interesting uh, to you. And uh, so this poll uh, should come up. And uh, please, I mean, this is uh, like a multiple choice. You can uh, click several of these questions. What are the questions? Uh, that you would be most interested in, uh, that we, you know, answer them right here. And so we will take the two or three uh, questions that get the most uh, votes here, and we will address these questions. So uh, the questions are, what is more important, the implant or the audio processor? Why are 22 channels not better than 12? Uh, is a deep electrode insertion more traumatic? How important are automatic electrodes and the preservation of hearing in general? What are uh, future goals with regards to our uh, to improving the speech understanding and music enjoyment? Uh, what is the best approach to successfully retrain music? And uh, we've heard about that a bit. Uh, what do hearing implant users struggle uh, with when practicing music? How precise is pitch perception with the CI? So please give us your, your vote here. And okay. So I think we have uh, three questions that, well, then no. Okay. <laughs> I take it back, you know, the scenery has changed. Okay, then let's look at it. Okay. Uh, first question, how precise is pitch perception with the CI? This is the first question we want to answer. Uh, then uh, let's talk about what are the future goals with regards to improving uh, speech and music understanding. And uh, yeah, then we have two that are uh, the same. Well, let's go to the first uh, two there. They're music related. How precise is pitch perception? And you know what are future goals at Medell with regards to improving speech understanding and music appreciation? Um, Johanna, do you want to answer the first question? How precise is pitch perception with the CI? Um, sure, I, I can, can also you can also uh, add to that. Yeah, I'm sure Pierre and I we have different perspectives uh, on this, and um, so my answer to that would be a, kind of to use our users as, ex as example, like what are they able to do, and. Um, I uh, conducted a study using Meludia, which actually showed that uh, the majority, over 80% of the participants are able to, to differentiate a semitone. And um, that is something that otherwise in the literature is reported, um, there's you know, a, um, a wider range of discrimination um, and a lot of professionals in the field don't believe that cochlear implant users can discriminate semitones, the smallest musical interval. Um, but we have shown it's possible. And I think, um, you know, the musicians I'm in contact with, uh, obviously, they need this precision, precision to play their instruments. And um, they perform very well, and we see more musicians singing. And for that, you also need very precise pitch in order to uh, have a good intonation. And uh, I think all three of you just recently experienced the Grand Finale in Vienna, and you've heard our users perform. 
and uh, the musicians that watched this concert really were impressed by the intonation and the pitch precision. It's so, from a scientific point of view, or well, I think we, yeah, I th I think the the question probably relates to the question how close is the, how close is the pitch or how identical is the pitch that one hears through a CI uh, to the pitch that one hears for the same frequency through normal hearing. Uh, and there is recent research that was done in uh, in uh, in Germany and uh, in Belgium that shows that uh, pitch through a CI comes closest to the pitch that somebody experiences for the same frequency through normal hearing, if you stimulate, and I'm getting back to what I talked about earlier before, if you stimulate the cochlea in the correct place and in the correct way, and by way, I mean this piece of timing information, uh, then uh, if you do that, then uh, pitch perception through ECI can come very, very close, at least on average, very, very close to pitch perception through normal hearing, which means then a frequency of say 200 Hertz really sounds the same to, the CI, to a CI recipient as to a normal hearing person. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly, again, the philosophy of Medell. Through long electrodes, we stimulate the cochlea, at least we attempt to stimulate the cochlea in the correct place, if you don't have a long electrode, if you other, if you only cover the first turn of the cochlea, you cannot stimulate the cochlea even close to the correct place for a certain frequency, uh, especially for the low frequencies. Um, uh, and then, in on on top of using a long electrode, as I've shown in the in, the, in that one uh, animation, for the low frequencies, we stimulate the cochlea uh, in uh, in synchrony with the sound signal. Uh, and that again then produces the right way of stimulation uh, in the cochlea for the low frequencies. So these two things together really then bring a CI user in terms of pitch as close as possible to a normal hearing user. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I also want to say that another okay. element. Okay. Sorry, okay. Can, sorry, can I say sorry. There, Oh a, yeah, of course. There's a question actually from the uh, from, 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 uh, in, in the chat. Okay. Uh, about pitch discrimination, my CI went live five weeks ago. Okay. And I, five weeks, I mean, that's not a long that's experience. That's not long, no. Uh, that's and not. I started simple ear training exercises on my on the e-piano. I reasonably hear all 88 keys and my favorite tone is A0, so that's 27.5 Hertz. The two octaves after that are great, but from F3 to G5, pitch discrimination is mercury. After that, all the way up to C8, fine again. What happens? Uh, going above F3 and then above G5, how does metal give support to improve the mid range? So there seems to be a uh, there seems to be a range uh, that is fine, and then some range that is uh, you know not, not so perfect. What, what would you answer, Peter? Um, um, we have we have developed something that goes beyond the three the two elements that I just showed. Uh, the, the, the natural pitch you experience in the low frequencies, I would think really comes from this temporal way, from, this, uh, from the way that we stimulate the, uh, the electrodes in the low frequency region in the correct temporal um, uh, way. Um, in the mid frequency region, we have developed something that could bring your pitch, especially even closer to normal hearing pitch. Uh, we have developed a way where your fitting can be adapted to where actually the electrode contacts are in the cochlea. And I mean each individual electrode contact. Uh, so far, the fitting experts in a clinic, with the audiologists, the rehab people, they've been pretty blind or totally blind with respect to where the uh, electrode actually is positioned in a, in, a, in a concrete cochlea, that is in a concrete user. Uh, and, then, and then some standard way of fitting those electrode contacts to a certain frequency range were applied. Now we've developed a tool that's called anatomy-based fitting that based on post-operative images, if that's done by your clinic, the audiologist can actually see 
and identify at what frequency a certain electrode contact is located in the cochlea, and then can adapt the fitting uh, according to this uh, additional piece of information. So that might be something that's maybe helping in your case, and you would have to talk to your clinic whether that's something they do or not. It's pretty new. If they don't do it right away, if they don't know about it right away, please guide them to your local uh, Medell office and, and let them teach your clinic. Um, but there is ways that all I want to say is there is ways on top of complete of what we call complete cochlear coverage as a result of long electrodes and fine structure or temporal information in the cochlear region. On top of that, to further refine the fitting to make uh, pitch and music So that is basically better. tailoring uh, the frequencies right, to right, each individual right. Uh, user. Right, that's even yeah. further individualizing yeah. cochlear implant treatment. With also ways to allow the, uh, that's not really applicable in your case anymore, but we've also worked out ways to identify how long a certain cochlea, for example, is, right? Uh, and then pick the most suitable electrode array to really cover the entire cochlea. Unfortunately, cochlea vary quite a bit between individual humans um, but I think in, in terms of case, length. The... But in this case, it's really the fitting yeah, right. and rehab. Exactly. And yeah. training. Really so, so it seems the brain, be... the brain is will also be helping you. Yeah. The brain is flexible. The brain can adapt to some distortions, right? So what uh, what Johanna has really mentioned, and also Jen, fit, uh, not only fitting but also training is an important uh, step in getting further with your CI. So, so it's basically and a again, combination of, and of again, design. Fitting right. and training and, and training. Yep. And, and there's and a follow-up question here in the, in the chat. And can I just say, oh, and, yes. and, and, and don't get disappointed. Five weeks is not long. No. Yeah. You're no. not far right. into the into the CI, into the hearing learn training. hearing with the CI process. So it will get better. Don't give up. Five weeks is yes. not long. Is I think not that, long. that answers another question four weeks ago activated four weeks ago, I found sounds are getting better every week. And so, so yes, right. there is a learning process that is not finished after after four weeks. There's another follow-up question. Is anatomy, the anatomy fitting part uh, of your regular software distribution? So is this anatomy-based fitting yes. part yes. in the regular yes. software? Yes. yes, yes, it's in the regular yep. clinical software. Yep. Okay, good. Uh, I think that uh, answers uh, that part. Let's go, and, and I think we got the associated questions. Uh, okay, uh, let, let, let me, uh, what, what are future goals with regards to improving speech understanding and music? I think one thing that we'll be, that we are focusing on, and Peter just mentioned about uh, anatomy-based fitting, um, we will continue, I think, down this road in respect of the natural tone of typicity and place uh, pitch, um, so to speak, with regards to fitting. And we've seen, and research supports this, that in, as we go down this route, um, the success rate or the satisfaction, so to speak, with, with music and speech perception is improving. So I think that's one aspect that we will continue to go down to improve overall hearing performance. Anything to add, Peter, Johanna? Um, just to add, really, uh, we continue to uh, um, work on individualization mm -hmm. in different and, ways. And make it easier. Yes. Yeah. And make it easier. I, I have to say that uh, what I just talked about anatomy-based fitting. At this point in time, uh, it is a bit of an effort for the clinic, uh, a post-operative CT is nothing that every clinic does. We're working on ways to derive the same uh, bits of information that are now derived from a post-operative clinical image from other sources mm -hmm. through the CI. Um, so, making, and that's now rather, rather relating to the clinicians among you, making the entire fitting uh, easier, mm -hmm. but not less effective. Correct. And not less beneficial uh, is really a big goal. 
uh, we really, and I can say that because I'm also working on fitting algorithms, uh, we really, we really struggle with making fitting easier, quicker, less effort fell for the audiologist and the user, uh, the CI user, uh, but not give up on quality, uh, at least not significantly, right? So, so that is a dilemma that we need to resolve in the future. And, and we're working on, there are ways uh, uh, and we're working on, but it, that is a dilemma that we that clinics are currently in and we need to help them. You know, you can either spend an hour to, for a certain user and fit the user, or you spend half an hour each on two users, right? Mm -hmm. And get them maybe less optimally fitted, but still you've treated two use patients, so to speak, right? So that is a dilemma that we are, mm -hmm. that we need to okay. solve in the future. Thank you. There's one question. Uh, my, Da, 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 da. My son, five years old, has bilateral CI. I'm wondering if the position of the processor makes a difference in sound experience. As I noticed, he rotated to, to a certain position to get it to flash green, or is he doing it to make it more clear? He has the Rondo 2. Jen. Um, it, it's, it's difficult to say, um, but some of the aspect can be also with regards to fitting. And I, one thing to uh, know is it was a sequentially implanted or was he simultaneously implanted? But this aspect that Peter was bringing up earlier with regards to anatomy-based fitting, um, we're seeing now with bilateral implants where they, as an example, may have different electrode insertion lengths mm -hmm. that the anatomy based fitting helps bring the two sides together. And so this may be uh, one aspect. Usually the position of the processor, as long as it's connecting well with the, with the uh, magnet internally, um, usually the position externally doesn't have too much of an impact. It can have some, but it's usually minimal. It's more about the fitting aspect mm -hmm. that, that really and, and, brings and, and that and together. To, to that, I mean, the processor can be fit in a, in a way that the microphone is more directed to the front. Absolutely. And then there is uh, also a, a, a fitting that is basically picking up from, right. from all around. Maybe the second question here come, comes uh, the, the, the same participant. Uh, my son can hear from far, but has a hard time recognizing recognizing where the sound is coming from. How can we practice learning the direction uh, sound is coming from? Uh, will hide and seek be a good way to practice? I mean, can can localization be uh, be practiced? Is that like music, or, or uh, how is that? I mean, I would assume that again, what you mentioned is uh, is have the the two implants been implanted at the same time. But 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 what's your your, your take on that? Um, I think two aspects. One, fitting to, to make sure that um, the two sides are um, equal or, or, or balanced in terms of loudness and, and in terms of quality. Um, once that's done, then yes, training can be uh, used to help improve mm -hmm. that. But I think the first step is to make sure that the fitting is mm -hmm. correct so that the implants are really or the processors are really balanced. Yeah, yeah. And, okay. and, I, and it's important. I mean, I don't know, it's probably, it's not in the chat, uh, but your, your son needs to be bilaterally implanted. Yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that was, it, it is, it is. That was the first yeah. question. Five ah, years okay. old, bilateral okay. CI. Yeah. So and then I have uh, to say, um, spatial hearing, that's called spatial hearing. If mm -hmm. you know where a sound is coming from in space, uh, that's in this field called spatial hearing. Spatial hearing develops over time. Yeah. Yeah. Also in normal hearing children, right? Yeah. So spatial hearing develops over time. So yes, practice will help. Mm -hmm. Will help to move on in spatial hearing. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, Verena just posted in uh, the chat. Uh, that if you have other questions, this is not limited to, to this session. Also, if we maybe uh, missed a question or we don't have time to answer all questions, uh, there is a link uh, where all these questions can be answered and where you can also uh, ask questions. Um, so uh, let's, let's address the other two questions here that were in the poll. 
uh, da, 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 is a deep electrode insertion more traumatic than a shallow? I mean, there is these fine structures in the cochlea. We know Medel is very, uh, you know, looking at uh, structure preservation in the cochlea. Uh, Jen, what would you say? Uh, it can be, but Medel's electrodes are very soft and flexible, and we design them specifically to be atraumatic. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And there is enough space. Uh, that's also to say there is enough space uh, in the uh, in the cochlea, in, in yeah. the upper parts of the cochlea to, to fit the electrode. It's yes. not that it would be kind of damage anything by being too big. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Peter, I think this is a question to you. Why are 22 channels not better than, than 12? It, it seems like, you know, Medel, we have 12 channels. Mm -hmm. Are we at a, uh, in a disadvantage uh, compared to other no, systems? No, we are not. I think we're rather at an advantage because if you, um, if you increase the number, I, I'm getting into why is uh, 22 not better from two sides, yeah? The first one is electrode design. The first one is this question, how, uh, how traumatic or atraumatic is an electrode? The more contacts you have on your electrode carrier, that is your more channels you have on your electrode carrier, the more wires need to be in the electrode carrier, the stiffer the electrode carrier or the electrode will be, uh, and the more potentially traumatic the electrode uh, is. So keeping the number of channels reasonably low improves the atraumaticity of the electrode contact. Now the question is, do you then, if you do that, do you then in turn lose pitches, right? So you might think, okay, with 22 channels, I can stimulate 22 uh, positions along the, elect along the cochlea, which produces 22 pitches. And with 12, uh, it's only 12 positions along the cochlea and it's only 12 pitches. Now, fortunately, that's not true. Um, if you stimulate two adjacent electrodes, um, either simultaneously or in rapid succession after each other, then what you hear is a pitch that's intermediate to the pitch to the uh, pitches produced to the pitch produced by the one electrode in isolation and the other electrode in isolation. So in other words, we can create a continuum of pitches between two adjacent electrode contacts, and that's all along the cochlea. So how many pitches so, are we so, talking about here? So while the, the theoretical limit of pitches in our system with the 12 electrodes, with the 12 channels, is 250 which is by far, as research shows, high enough to really then uh, allow each individual user to resolve as many, as many pitches as he individually can, you know, based on the individual con uh, condition of mm -hmm. his, that was a bit much individual, of his individual <laughs> cost, <laughs> okay. so to speak. Okay, right? thank you. So technically, th th what I wanna say is, our system is technically not limiting the number of pitches that you can hear through your cochlear implant. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Last question here, very practical. Uh, how many years can we expect our recent internal components to last? We have users that are 20 years and beyond. Um, we have a, um, all of our audio processors that we design um, are backwards compatible. And so, um, yeah, <laughs> that's why the implant is so important compared to the audio processor, um, is the implant's gonna be there for a long, long okay, time. Yeah. And the audio processor is going to change. Mm -hmm. And, um, Everything, as I said, that we come out with, all new audio processors will be backwards compatible from day one. Okay. Yeah. So, so I started with Medell about 25 years ago uh, and quite a few users that were implanted mm -hmm. at that time still use the first Medell implant. Yep. So my answer would be 25 years. Well, that's the proven, <laughs> you know? <laughs> we can't really look into the future. I mean, there is no theoretical limit to That's the right. lifetime of your implant. Hmm. 
that's what I can say. Now, you know how far we, we do accelerated lifetime testing also in house, um, where you try to, you know, model aging of the implant and so on and so on. Uh, and that extends 20 years and 25 years and beyond, but nobody can really look into yeah. the future and then right. say, well, it'll be 50 years. We're not there yet, right? And at some point, I would assume that the technology is outdated. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't want to drive a car that is 50 right. years old. Right, <laughs> but, but again, as, as, as Jen said, we've never left um, an, an, any existing user behind, yeah? All our audio processors that we brought out so far, now up to the, where are we? Rondo 3, right? Mm -hmm. Up to the Rondo 3 Sonnet 2. We're backwards compatible across 25 years from the first day they, they came on the market, yeah? So if you, at least so far, our history is that if you decide for Medell, uh, you're not worse off than a newly implanted user so far, right? In terms of that we are, that we are leaving you behind in terms of innovation, right? Okay. So that's our proven record. Uh, yeah. We really do everything we can, although that's quite a burden in our R&D where I come from. Yeah. So far, we do everything we can to keep up with that yeah. um, legacy or history. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Johanna. Thank you all the participants for your interest. I just want to mention uh, one thing um, and maybe we can, well, we don't have to put up the, the PowerPoint. There is still coming up today, uh, a sound sensation. We have uh, three more music, uh, daily music doses at four local time here. We have the workshop uh, music for your child and at uh, starting from, from uh, 7 uh, p.m. is the, the grand finale. This is really something you have to see. It's amazing what comes together when musical uh, talented people that are implanted uh, make music on a very high level, play and sing together with professional musicians, a real, the real highlight of our uh, Sound Sensation Festival. So thank you very much and goodbye.